From Luke chapter 2, we read, In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration that was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All went to their own town to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was a descendant from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. They were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that's taken place which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd told them. But Mary, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard And all that had been told to them. Friends, this is the good news. No, this is the great news of Christmas Eve, of the Christmas gospel. And as we begin tonight, grace, peace, and mercy to you in the name of the Christ child. In a book called VIP, the author Frank Mead told the story of a sleepy little Midwestern town called Mayfair. And it seemed that One Christmas season, the people of Mayfair were all excited because they knew they were having an important visitor, a wealthy, well-known, famous man coming to visit them in their town. His name was Henry Bascom. He was coming with his entourage, and he was coming to spend the whole holiday there, and they knew this would bring a lot of notoriety to their town, but it would also bring a lot of money to their town, too. And so practically every man, woman, and child of Mayfair showed up at the airport that night on the night of Henry Bascombe's arrival. And the jet landed, but the only thing was Henry Bascombe was nowhere to be found. And as they were looking around, looking for kind of a flamboyant character, kind of a Donald Trump type guy, meanwhile, they didn't notice a quiet, poorly dressed man slip through the anxious crowd. He was all alone. He didn't look like he was important. He didn't act like he was important. And so the people of Mayfair pretty much ignored him and treated him badly. They were very insensitive to him. He he couldn't get a cab. He couldn't make a reservation at a restaurant for dinner. He couldn't get a hotel room, all because the people of Mayfair were all looking for this great, great man, and they didn't notice that he was right under their noses. You get the picture, don't you? The folks of Mayfair were looking for pageantry and pomp and circumstance, and they didn't have time of day for a humble stranger that seemed to be wandering through their midst. And finally that night, it was an elderly parking lot attendant that invited this wandering stranger to his house for dinner. It was a very humble little house, a little family, and a very meager little meal. But after that meal, this, this stranger made his way back to the airport and as he made his way towards the, uh, the runway, he, he noticed that the workmen were taking down a big sign that said, Welcome to friendly Mayfair, Henry Bascombe. And he heard one of the workmen turn to the other and say, I can't believe it. How, how did we miss him? He's got to be here in our town. What happened to Henry Bascombe? And with that, <laughs> with that, 
The unassuming stranger made his way back onto a, wait, a waiting jet, and it took off, and he left the tragic little town of Mayfair with no sort of pomp and circumstance at all. And friends, I share that story with you tonight from this book because it seems to me that we just heard another reading about a humble visitor that was easily overlooked, easily missed. He was the child of an unwed teenage mother. He was born into poverty. He was born in Bethlehem, kind of a low-class little town. He was wrapped in old rags and laid in, get this, laid in a manger, which is what? A feed trough for animals. He cried and, and dirtied his diaper through the night, and I tell you, this little stranger did not look like anybody special. He certainly didn't look like royalty or a king. And the people of Bethlehem, they were probably a lot like the people of Mayfair, where they had their own expectations of what they were looking for or expecting. They had their own prejudices that kept them from seeing what was right, right under their noses. And so was it any wonder that Mary and Joseph weren't able to find an inn to stay in that night? You know, there's a true story about King George of England who years ago made a trip to the blue-class working city of Leeds. And elaborate preparations were made for his visit. There were throngs of people up and down the sides of the railroad track waiting for the train to pull in with the king on it. And uh, in fact, they even went to an elementary school and they herded the kids out to the playground so they could all wave to the king when he showed up. And soon... A train came through a long tunnel and it stopped on the railroad track not far from the playground where all these kids were. And the king stepped out of the royal coach. He stepped on a platform so everybody could see him. But listen to this. The king wasn't wearing a crown. He, he wasn't wearing a purple robe or anything like that. He was just wearing a business suit like most of the men were wearing out in the crowd there. He took a handkerchief out of his lapel and he waved to the crowd and then minutes later he disappeared back into the coach and he was gone just as quickly as he had showed up. And as the cheering subsided and the crowd began to go home and disperse, the crying of a little girl could be heard. And one of the teachers from the elementary school knelt, knelt down and said, Honey, what are you crying for? What, what's the matter? The little girl said this, she said, I wanted to see a king. All I saw was a man. I wanted to see a king. All I saw was a man. And friends, on that first Christmas, it would seem to me that most of the eyewitnesses may have said the same thing that night. They may have said, we wanted to see a king. All we saw was a baby. What's with that? Can you imagine the objections? God, can't you do any better than that? A baby? How about something bigger and grander? How about something more impressive? What were you thinking? Sending a baby. Why would you send us a baby to do a man's work? Why would you send us a baby to do God's work? But you see, a baby it was. It was no mistake. Through this baby, God was slipping under the radar screen of the high and mighty of the world. Through this baby, God was slipping under the radar screen of the who's who of this world. God chose not to come as larger than life like most of our politicians would like to come. God chose to shrink himself down into the form and the size of a baby. And listen to this, not just a helpless baby, but he also chose to come as a Jew, a hated race of people, especially in those days. He also chose to come as a peasant, a poor person with nothing, nothing that he owned, certainly no power, no prestige. And he chose to come to a backwards country at a backwards time where there was no communication, there was no media. There was no way to get the word out about him. And get this. Not only did God choose to come in a small package himself, but he chose to come to the small and the insignificant, to the peasants, to the shepherds, to the barnyard animals, to the little people of Bethlehem. I tell you again, there was nothing classy or swank about what people saw that first Christmas Eve. And this may be telling us something about who God has a special place in his heart for. God, why would you come this way? Well, listen to this. Years ago, Henry Nouwen wrote, God wanted to take away the distance between humans and the divine. Who can be afraid of a little baby who needs to be fed and cared for and taught and guided? 
We usually speak of God as being all-powerful and almighty, one that we depend on completely. But now one goes on and says, but God, God wanted to become the all-powerless, the all-vulnerable God who depends on us. And then he ends with, and who can be afraid of a God who wants to be God with us? Who can be afraid of a God who wants to be God with us? And so again, friends, rather than appearing in the clouds and supersizing himself, rather than frightening us to death, the king of all kings comes to a meager stable and is laid in an animal's feed trough like this with a few lowly shepherds there as witnesses to to try to offer some sort of homage to him. And the true gift of Christmas is this, God came in the flesh. The true gift of Christmas is tenderness and mercy delivered here in a manger. You know, I love what the great English author C.S. Lewis used to say about this story. He said, you know this story is true because it's so hard to believe. Lewis went on to say, a much more believable story could have been written, but this is the story we tell because this is the truth. And friends, on this night, we are reminded, this is the truth about God, and this is the truth about all that God holds dear. God showed us at Bethlehem His values and priorities, and you know what? A lot of them are very different from the values and priorities that perhaps you and I have. God showed us at Bethlehem that power and prestige are illusions. They will not last. God showed us at Bethlehem that glamour and glitz are window dressings, and they will wither like grass on a hot, steamy day. God shows us at Bethlehem that pride and pretense are worthless. They are false security. And God showed us at Bethlehem that greatness and grandeur have little to do with the size of a person or the size or the stature of someone. Because again, God showed us at Bethlehem that God can do great things through the small, the very small, in fact, even a baby. And so on this night, we focus on a baby. Small and weak and delicate, a baby. God went to great lengths to, sh- to shrink himself down and to come in our size and our type. And it was through this small, quiet way that God went about redeeming the entire world. I tell you this, this baby, this baby knows far more than you think that he does. This baby knows the name of every person here. He knows our hopes, our dreams, our fears, our joys. He knows you and I need a Savior. He knows you and you and you and you and you. He knows more about us than we realize. And He comes to us tonight as a gift. And so the question for each of us here is this. Will we keep this gift, this Savior, at an arm's distance? Will we just try to sentimentalize this story? Or will we embrace the baby? Will we take it in? Will it become a part of our lives? And not just at Christmas, but all through the year. Will it shape our lives and our schedules and our priorities and our values? Will it shape who we are? That's the real question of Christmas. Because if it doesn't, we might as all well go home. Right here and right now. Let me close with this. It was years ago that the great American author and poet Carl Sandburg said, A baby is God's opinion that the world should go on. Grandmas and grandpas, isn't that true? A baby is God's opinion that the world should go on. We see that time and time again at the birth of a child. But listen to this. This baby we're talking about tonight goes beyond that because this baby is God's opinion. Not only that the world should go on, but eternity should go on. He's opened a door that was never available to us before. And now it is. You see, that's why the Christ child came. May you and I receive this child. I mean, really receive him. This small child, this great God. Let's pray. Oh Lord, again tonight, we are humbled and mystified by how and why you would shrink yourself down to become one of us. But God, we pray that it's more than sentimentality, it's more than a story, it's more than just the telling of it. God, help us to live it, help us to be it, 
Help it to transform our lives, our families, our church, our community. God, thank you once again for this great gift. And let all the people of God together tonight say, Amen. Amen.